Don't step off somewhere, but I think we'll be okay. I think we'll be okay. A couple weeks ago, Riz and I were at Costco. We got our stuff, got in the car, and I took my phone out, put it on my little phone thing that goes, uh, stick my phone on the, on the dashboard. I said, hey, Siri, uh, get directions home. He said, you don't know the way home? And I was like, uh, good, good word, good question. But uh, there's about four different ways I could go home. And, and the GPS inside my phone and the satellites that are uh, orbiting around, uh, around the planet, they have more data than I have. Uh, and they know that there might be a, a faster way than other ways. And so generally, generally it's right. It's not always right. But generally it's right. And it's good to follow the directions of somebody who, who knows more than you do. And I thought about that. That's maybe a good analogy or metaphor for God. Because God is kind of like GPS. Uh, or should I say GPS is kind of like God. There's some similarities, but there's some differences. For instance, GPS is always there. You just take out your phone, boom, their satellites are there, they're working, your phone's working, as long as your battery's working. Uh, God is always there. He didn't have a battery, he doesn't need one. So he's, he is always there. And GPS does have more data than you have. And God, obviously, he has all the data. He, he's got all the data. More important, or not more important, but along with all that data and all that information, God also has something GPS doesn't have. That's wisdom. God has wisdom. Uh, God also cares deeply for you. GPS uh, couldn't care less uh, for you. So it's that combination, really, of love uh, and wisdom that we see in the Word of God. When he gives us these instructions, these, these directions for our living, which are the subject of our new series, Life Preservers, God's Instructions for Flourishing. You know, uh, these, command, these ten commandments are really a condensate, condes- that's not the right word, a condensing, there we go, of God's Old Testament law that he gave to the people of Israel and still is available to us today. Some people might go, well, I thought Jesus did away with the law, but actually Jesus said the exact opposite of that. He said, I didn't come to abolish the law, but I came to fulfill the law. Particularly, he was speaking of the moral law, not the ceremonial or ritual law, but the moral law. And the Ten Commandments, to me, represent the very central piece of of these these guidelines for living that God uh, wants to give us. Guidelines for uh, a flourishing life. You know, uh, think of life uh, like a, a road, and, and you're heading down the road, and you've got a destination in mind. Well, what's, what's our destination? What's God's destiny? What's his desire for us? Well, we, we know it is this, this abundant life, this flourishing life, this life of meaning and, and fulfillment and purpose and ultimately heaven when heaven and earth come together, when Jesus returns and we live into the fullness of his kingdom. That's the destination that we're on. And think of the law uh, the, and the Ten Commandments particularly like guardrails along that road that will keep you on the path headed towards your destination. But some people think about, well, guardrails rules, instructions, laws, that, that stuff's too restrictive. It puts a crimp in my style. I, I want to do whatever I want to do, whenever I want to do it. I want to be the one in charge of my life. I'm the boss of me. You know what that sounds like to me? A child. Just think parents, those of you who are parents, uh, when your children were little, just think if you just let your kids do whatever they wanted to do, whenever they wanted to do it. I want, I want to eat cotton candy for supper every night. Okay. I, I don't want to have a bedtime. I'll be in charge of my own bedtime. Thank you very much. Uh, okay. You know, school's getting ready to start. Uh, what if the kid says, well, I don't want to go to school, ever. And the parents say, okay. That wouldn't be very loving, would it? Matter of fact, it would be the opposite of loving. If you hate your children, don't give them guardrails. Don't give them boundaries. Don't create order in their life. Don't ever say no if you hate your kids. Now, if you love your kids, like most of us do love our children, 
we want them to have these directions, these uh, instructions, if you will. And that's what God, that's how God feels about us. He has some instructions, some directions for our life so that we can experience the flourishing life that God intends for us uh, to lead and to live. And so that's what we're talking about in this series, Life Preservers. So this morning we're going to look, you know, there's ten commandments and we're going to take just the first commandment this morning. And what I've uh, done with this, this series is look, you know, thou shalt not, take all the negative, the, you know, the, the no's, don't do this, the boundaries, and look at the positive side. Well, what's the reason behind that boundary? So what is the positive side of the boundary in the, in the commandment? So let me look at, uh, let's look at Exodus 20. By the way, I didn't get bifocals, so... Might, might do that next year. Um, we're just going to look at 2 and 3 of, of Exodus chapter 20. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall have no other gods uh, before me. God is God, and I'm not God. Uh, God is in control. He's in charge. As much as I like to think I'm in control, I'm not. Uh, he's given me some things to have some control over and to be steward, a steward of, of, of uh, my energy and my time and the resources he's placed into my hand. He expects me to exercise uh, that uh, control. Uh, but he is the one that's ultimately in control. Never forget about your health. Uh, but Steve won the lottery of pancreatic sick kinds. There's the fast-growing kind that's very, very deadly, usually almost always terminal. And then there's less than 1% of all the cases of pancreatic cancer of the, this kind that he had. It's slow-growing, and if they catch it early enough, they can cure you. And the cure is surgery followed up by chemotherapy. But to the horror of Steve's physicians, his family and his associates, he decided not to go with the advice of his caregivers and decided he could figure it out on his own. He'd always been kind of an oddball about his diet and things, and so he went to, on a strict uh, vegan diet. He uh, started drinking lots of carrot juice and other uh, vegetable juices and fruit juices. He tried acupuncture. He went on the internet. You know Dr. Internet, right? Uh, and looked up some supposed experts, and so he went to a few of those, including one was a psychic. I don't know what that was going to supposed to do. He was obstinate and insistent on doing his own thing for nine months, and finally uh, he bent to the advice of his friends and his family and went back to the, the oncologist and they did a CT scan, a CAT scan, and his cancer had spread and grown. They did a bunch of treatment and all, but, but Steve Jobs died at the age of 56 years old. I think it's a good illustration of why I'm not necessarily the best leader of myself. Uh, we, need, we need help. Particularly, we need help from God. One of the reasons I'm not the best leader of, my, of myself is I don't have all the information. You know, God has all the information. I, I, my intelligence is limited. God's intelligence is, is unlimited. I don't, also, I don't have the, a big enough perspective. You see, God has the big picture perspective. He, he sees all time. He knows all about me. He knows more than I know about myself even. And then also, I am susceptible to deception, whereas God is not. And that was the problem in the garden, wasn't it, with Adam and Eve. The devil tempted them and said, are you sure God said that? Is that what God really said? And it's amazing how the devil is still tempting us in that same way uh, today. So God has all the wisdom. He has all the perspective. And he, lo he has all the knowledge. And he loves me. So I want to keep God first and let God lead. That's the fill-in on, on your outline. I want to keep God first. And one of the ways I do that, one of the primary ways I do that, is I let God lead. You know, a lot of us are what I would consider uh, practical deists. 
We believe in God. Deism was, it's not popular today, but it was very popular in the 18th century in the Western world. And they believe in God. They believe there is a God, but they see God very differently than what the Bible presents God as. They see God as kind of like the creator God, and he made a watch, like the universe is a watch. And he made the watch, and he wound up the watch, this, this watchmaker God, this deist God. And then he just set the watch aside, and because he wound it up, and it's got all the parts and all the pieces, he just let it go, and he walked away. And this God isn't engaged. He's not involved. There are no miracles. There's no scripture. There's no need for his instruction. There's no need for God to get involved in your life. And so a lot of us, we wouldn't proclaim that doctrine, but that's how we live our lives, because we keep God out there somewhere. But God, in the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit, he wants to guide us. He wants to lead us. He wants to direct our lives. He wants to show us the way, the path, his way, uh, the way of God. And that's what we see in the Ten Commandments. God leading us, God guiding us, God giving us some guidelines, and God speaking to us. And the Holy Spirit reminding us when we get off the path, hey, here's the path. (laughs) Come on, come on back. Come on back to the path, the path that leads uh, to life. And so uh, one of the best places that I see this, that illustrates this from the scripture, is, um, is Psalm 23. Psalm 23, verses 1 through 3. No, I'll skip this whole thing. <laughs> I'll skip Matthew 20. Uh, that's okay. We're going to leave it for another time. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores, restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. He leads me. God guides me. He directs my life. The alternative is for me to direct my life or to let somebody else direct my life. Um, God wants to be God and he, and, and he wants to lead our lives. He wants to guide our lives. He wants to, he wants to direct our lives like a shepherd directs his sheep. A shepherd doesn't just open the gate and say, see you later, hope you make it back later tonight. No, the shepherd is, is guiding us. But we've got to have one voice, not multiple voices. When I was uh, in undergraduate school, I was a, um, a chemistry major, and I worked for a professor by the name of Dr. Wei Ping Pan. Uh, he was, I was his teaching assistant in his physical chemistry lab. And a friend of mine who was a senior and graduating, he, was, he worked for a different professor, a guy by the name of John, Dr. John Riley in the coal chemistry lab. This is at Western Kentucky. Coal chemistry was a big thing. Still is, but it was a bigger thing back then. Anyway, his name is Fred. Fred was graduating, and Dr. Riley wanted somebody else to come and work for him, so he asked me if I would go learn how to do the stuff that Fred was doing, and I could come work for him and keep working for Dr. Pan. So I said, great, I'll do that. So when I, talked to, I went and spoke to Dr. Pan. I said, Dr. Pan, Dr. Riley wants me to work for him, but I can work for you at the same time, and this will be great. And Dr. Pan said, you know, that's great. That might be a good opportunity for you, but if you go to work for uh, Dr. Riley, you can't work for me. Uh, Two professors in the same department with one student worker, that's probably going to create some conflict. That's going to just not be what we need. Yeah, I think Dr. Pan was right. I I stayed with Dr. Pan, by the way. But I I think that was wise, and that was wisdom from the Scripture. Matthew uh, chapter 6, verse 24. It says, no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Now, you can't have two masters. You can't have two gods. There's only one God anyway, right? That word money there is uh, actually, it's really interesting, but in the New Testament, you know, it's written in Greek, but that word's an Aramaic word. 
It's, it's the word mammon. You've probably heard that before because some of our translations just translate it that way, mammon. It means material wealth, uh, possessions. Basically, it's your stuff. And what Jesus is saying, you can't worship your stuff and, and worship God. If, if the main thing in your life is stuff and taking care of your stuff and getting more stuff and being about your stuff, then God can't be the main thing in your life. And we understand that, right? Materialism has been a problem for, for millennia. But you know, my stuff, even though it can't interfere with my relationship with God, is not God's main rival. Do you know what God's main rival is? God's biggest rival is me. God's biggest rival is me. Now, let's just pause for a minute. God, you know, God doesn't actually have any rivals. There are no rivals to God. God is God, and there are no other gods. But in my heart, in my devotion, I can have rivals to God. Uh, next week, we're going to talk about some of those. We're talking about idolatry, not having a carved image, not being, not being idolatrous. But this is part of that, that I'm the one who needs to get out of the way and let God be God. Now back to Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not what? I'm not my shepherd. You can't shepherd yourself. You're a sheep. You're not a shepherd. You know, some think, well, pastors are shepherds. Well, maybe. We're like under shepherds. But Jesus is the shepherd. He even said about himself, I am the good shepherd. Shepherd. What does a shepherd do? A shepherd actively leads. He actively guides his sheep. And where does the psalm say that he leads us? Besides still waters. You know, in the Hebrew, that's waters of rest. God wants to lead you into rest. You know, one of the reasons why we, our world is so crazy and our lives are so bent out of shape and we're so harried and busy We're not allowing God to lead us. And so we're saying yes to some things we shouldn't be saying yes to so that we can be saying yes to the things that God is calling us to say yes to. One of the things he wants to lead you into rest. And then green pastures. Makes me lie down in green pastures. Green as in in verdant, uh, flourishing, growing, productive. Abundant. That's what Jesus said when he said about himself being the good shepherd. That he is the one who leads us to an abundant life. That's what he wants to lead us into. An abundant, meaningful, fulfilling, purposeful life. Where we experience God's presence and we participate in God's purpose. There's an easy way and a hard way. The easy way is letting God lead you. Letting God shepherd you. Now look, in that psalm, the very next verse, it says, even when I go through the valleys, the darkest, deepest valleys, you're with me. So letting God lead doesn't mean bad things aren't going to happen in our lives or we're not going to face obstacles or challenges. That's not, that's not what I mean when I say the easy thing. Here, here's, here's just a little bit of truth for you. Every person living is going to go through dark valleys. Do you want to go through Dark Valley on your own? Or do you want to be led by the shepherd of life? I want to be led by the shepherd of life. So there's the easy way and the hard way. The easy way is allowing God to lead you. The hard way is trying to lead yourself. You know, I tried the hard way for a little while. Didn't work out well. Uh, My life was an utter and complete shambles. And they say, you know, you, you'll keep going that, down that lifestyle until you hit rock bottom. Thankfully for me, rock bottom was up here. It wasn't like way down here. You know, some people, there's no rock bottom. and They just keep going to the depths and the depths on into hell. Thank God, God got my attention. But what I've discovered is most people, the way they get off God's path is not through some big, out of, off the chain rebellion 
you know, not flipping God off and moving and doing your own thing. And that, that we, we don't see, I don't see a lot of people actually doing that. Most people, it's just through little choices along the way. Somebody said that, that um, the way sheep get lost is by nibbling their way lost. And this is true. You think about it. This is how we do in our lives. We're, we're nibbling. We're nibbling on that green grass. We're enjoying the blessings that God has given us. And, and pretty soon our focus is all on the blessings and less on God and less on our shepherd. And we just nibble our way out, away from his voice. We can't hear it. We look up and we're lost. We're missing out on the opportunities to live in the fullness of the abundant life that he, he wants for us. Has, have any of you nibbled your way lost? Have you just, just slowly drifted away from God? Just little choices here and there where now you find yourself wondering, where'd God go? Hear me, friends. God didn't go anywhere. If you'll repent, which means change your mind about your direction, turn around, God's right there with you. And he loves you. And he wants to guide your life. He wants you to lead you into the still waters, into the green pastures. His instructions, they're not overbearing. They're not restrictive. It's following God's guidelines. Staying in God's guardrails where we discover the most joy and the most freedom and the most hope that we can possibly experience on this side before Jesus returns. Let's pray. Loving and heavenly, loving heavenly Father, we, uh, we give you thanks and praise. You've shown us your love through your son Jesus, and we are blessed. But we, like sheep, have gone astray. We've nibbled our way off the path that leads to life. Lord, bring us back. Even today, as we come to, the, to your table, let this be a time of, of uh, opportunity and opportunity for grace and forgiveness and renewal. We want to recommit ourselves to following your way, the way that leads to a, the abundant life in Jesus Christ. It's in his name that we pray. Amen.